as the ushers come forward to receive this morning's tithes and offerings, I'd also like to call the kids forward. We have kids' church today. So if you consider yourself a kid, or you just really like Mrs. Glass, <laughs> 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 then you can come on forward. See, Mr. Glass is coming forward because he really likes Mrs. Glass. <laughs> Good morning, you guys. How are you today? Good. Good? Ouch. What's ouch? I know, our Mario moves can make us go too fast, can't they? Well, you know what? When we pray, we pray for our ouches too, don't we? Yeah, that's important. So why don't we pray for the offering, and we'll pray for Kids Church, and we can pray for your ouch. So I don't know if I know your name. What's your name? What's your Dom. name? Tom? Dom. Dom, okay. Dom, is it okay if I pray for your ouch? Okay. All right, let's pray together. <laughs> oh, God, you are faithful. You are faithful in the big things and the small things. You are faithful by giving us the things that we need, and we want to be faithful back to you with offering back our tithes and our offerings in worship of you so that more people can know about you. And you're faithful in looking after us, whether we are really little or really big. So thank you for all these kids. Thank you for Mrs. Glass. Thank you that they can go and learn about you just like we're learning about you in here. And we pray for Dom's ouch. Jesus, you are a healer. And when you died on the cross and rose again, part of what you offer us is healing. So we pray that you will help his ouch to go away and that you will heal him. Thank you for all of who you are because you are good all of the time and all of the time you are good. And in it's your name we pray. Amen. My name is Peter. I'm here as pastor, and I am here to welcome you this morning. We've got uh, some new faces. You're very welcome. I won't embarrass you, um, but I just want you to know that you're in a great place, and I'm thrilled that you're here. Uh, we've got some faces that uh, we haven't seen in quite a while. I'm glad you're here, too. Every uh, week, we do something as a congregation where we offer our requests and our praises to God, both and equal. He wants to hear our praises and he wants to hear our requests. And so the way that we do this is that uh, we just give opportunity and people call out what their request is, and then we'll take a moment and we will pray as a congregation. This is something that has been happening for a few weeks now, and as people have been becoming more comfortable with it, it's something that has, I think, enriched the experience here. Uh, for me, throughout, <coughs> pardon me, throughout the week, it's nice to know what to pray for. It's nice to know what's meaningful to you, what our praise is and what our call to the Lord is. So, I want to open it up right now, and let's start out uh, just by asking... Uh, has anyone got a praise to offer to the Lord today? Feel bold. Come on, call it out. I don't know, did anyone see that rainbow yesterday? My goodness, it was beautiful. Did you, anyone see a rainbow? Ted's rainbow. Oh, okay, not just Ted. We have a <laughs> rainbow. Let's have prayer requests and praises. Let's call them out. Be bold. How can we pray? Oh, Darlene, we prayed for uh, Darlene Babcock last week. She is at home uh, and, and recovering. She is not at home. She's sitting right there. All right, and later on we're going to have you come up here and do a dance. No? If, if you were here last week, Ron would have brought you up to, to... All right, Darlene is here with us. She was in the hospital last time. That is a praise. Okay, farmer's rain. Um, I had two different Manitoba people come to me today and say, I'm not trying to make anyone mad, but we need some sunshine so my parents can put in seed. So we're going to pray that the rain from Manitoba comes here and the sunshine from here goes there, but you're not allowed to get mad. <laughs> okay. How can we pray? Any word on Cam, how he's doing? He's back home and he still has a cough, but otherwise he's doing fine. 
All right, we've been praying for Cam, one of the Eston students. He was up here, <coughs> he preached, oh, a month ago, maybe even two months ago, and um, he has been quite ill uh, and uh, on, a, on a journey through BC, so we're glad he's better. Okay, the, what's his name? Howie. Howie? Okay, Howie, he's, uh, he's the announcer at uh, Flatlander Racetrack. I met a guy last night, um, I, was, uh, I was working on my car and he came because uh, he liked the car and he was standing around and we were talking about all kinds of things and he said, what do you do for a living? And I said, I'm a pastor and he, honest, about three minutes later he was gone like he was on fire. I wonder if God has something in store. I don't know his name, we didn't get that far. Um, I really hope he comes back. You know who's uh, coming next week to the service? Loose Lang Camp. So we're going to hear from them. Anything else we can pray for? All right. God hears our requests, silent and verbal. God hears the cries of our heart that are too deep for words. And God hears the cry of our heart that all we can do is Bring them as words. God is here, and he can hear. Here's what I'd like you to do. I'm going to get you to stand, and I will pray through uh, this list that we have here. At the end of each item, I would like you to join together, and this is just how you participate. And I would like you to repeat, I'd like you to say together, Lord, hear our prayer. Does that sound okay? You're willing to do this? All right, let's pray together. Well, Heavenly Father, we are thankful to you that we're able to come together to do this. And we're thankful for the freedom to do this. And we're thankful uh, for even the comfort of doing this. Even though it is not that, uh, it's not comfortable for everyone to do this, Lord. Uh, We are still more comfortable than many in this world. And we thank you for this. Lord God, thank you for the promise shown to us through that uh, rainbow. That uh, you will never again destroy this world. Uh, although we anticipate destruction at every turn, Lord God, your promise is that you won't. Thank you for this. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, we thank you for Darlene Babcock, um, and we thank you for her coming out of the hospital, and as she is on her journey to health, all of the different elements of that and different medication and doctors, Uh, Lord God, we thank you that she is out and that she is joined with us today, and we praise you for this. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, we do ask you for rain, and we ask you for rain here, and on the other hand, we also ask uh, for the people who are living in areas where it is just so soggy that they can't uh, seed. Uh, Lord, you provide the growing season. You provide the harvest season. Lord, would you provide the Uh, planting season for those who need it. Send their rain this way and send our sunshine that way. Lord, hear our prayer. We thank you for Cam's, um, I don't know that he's fully healthy, but he is returning to health. And we hear the uh, worry and the desire in grandma and grandpa's voice as they talk about him. Lord, we're thankful that he is getting healthy and that it was not something bigger than what it was. Lord, we ask for a full and total return to health. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for Howie, the announcer, out at uh, the racetrack. Lord God, uh, we pray for his return to health. Um, He's part of something bigger that's going on out there. And uh, Lord, only you know what's actually going on out there. But we know that you love those guys those guys and those girls. And we know, Lord, that uh, Howie is a big part of that. So, Lord, return him to health. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, we do not forget Ukraine. And, uh, Lord, we pray for Ukraine. We pray for peace in Ukraine. And, Lord, we, we pray for Russia and the leadership in Russia. Lord, let them desire for peace. Uh, swords into plowshares. 
Lord God. We pray for the soldiers. Uh, Russia is a different country than Canada and how it operates. And there are many soldiers, Lord, that don't want to be there. We know that that's true. And yet people are dying. Lord, bring peace. Oh, bring peace and safety. Lord, we think of Luda, who is uh, from Ukraine, and she's currently in Germany with her kids and uh, away from her husband. There's just so much in there. We think of the Friesens, and they have family uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and the, the contact there is uh, sporadic at best. How many people here come from that part of the world? And it's just, oh, it's the call of our heart, Lord. We pray that uh, you interfere in Ukraine and in Russia. Lord, hear our prayer. For the families grieving in Texas, uh, I can't. I can't imagine. And Lord, some of those families are the families of the shooter. When those people died, it made you sad. Because you love those people. Lord God, we ask for you to redeem. We ask for you to somehow bring good out of what is not good. And I'm glad your imagination is greater than mine. We pray for those families. Lord, call to them. Be comfort to them. Lord, hear our prayer. Uh, we pray for Andrew Kennedy and the musician, uh, the musician who's here. And as Ron works with him, Lord... Um, I think we are praying about critique and the difficultness of that. Yet it is good. And we're going to talk about refinement today. Lord, let this um, pairing be a beneficial thing. Lord, we pray that you've got something going on here. Something greater than just a new song. But rather, something uh, that's very much of you. We pray for Ron's neighbor, Paul. Lord, we ask for healing there, uh, full healing, for healing of cancer, Lord God. Um, full transparency, God, I have seen people healed and I have also seen people die of cancer. And when we say cancer, I flinch. So we just lay that at your feet and ask you to heal, Lord God. Lord, hear our prayer. For my friend who I don't know his name, but he would talk to me about cars right up and until he found out I was one of those freaky Jesus people. Bring him back. Lord God, let it be more than cars. Or speak through the cars, Lord, I don't need to know how, but I pray that he's drawn to you and whatever part of his story made him turn tail and run, we ask for healing there. Lord, let this church be part of it with all our hearts. We ask for this, Lord hear our prayer. For Looseland Camp, as they reach out to school groups, Lord, there are not a lot of Bible camps that are allowed to do that anymore. And schools will come and they will see, and Lord, we pray that you speak through that camp to these kids in a supernatural way, in a way that we can't account for. Lord, let this be the seeds that are planted. Lord, harvest, we don't know when that is. So let us plant seeds and plant them well. Lord God, for the exposure and also for the effectiveness and yes, safety, Lord God. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, for the people who are in leadership over us, the RCMP, the uh, conservation officers, the politicians, our mayor, citywide, province-wide, countrywide, globally, we ask protection and blessing and wisdom. Lord God, make us people who are humble to those in leadership over us, as you have called us to be. Lord, hear our prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In your name I pray. Amen. We are going to take a bit of a pause in our Hebrews series 
for a little while. Uh, for those of you looking for closure, don't worry, we will come back to it. Um, and we will finish that. And for those of you who have just now figured out that we're even in a series, uh, welcome to the Hebrew series, but we're hitting pause for just a minute. And we're going to talk about something that is happening in the church and has been happening behind the scenes. And I'm just going to bring it to your attention. And it's something that was brought up at the annual general meeting. It was brought up by uh, a member. It was brought up respectfully and and uh, graciously, and it means that it's something that we can lean into respectfully and graciously, and we can continue to talk about. And it is the idea of eldership. Who can be an elder? Most specifically, the conversation is going to be about whether or not women can be elders at Kindersley Alliance Church, which means that we're going to open up a conversation, and we are going to lean into this uh, for a period of time, And we're going to hear on Sunday mornings, and we're also going to hear throughout the week with different speakers. And there is going to be a time when there is a vote. It is a member's vote, which means you have to be a member to vote. For those of you who would like your voice heard and would like to enter into this conversation and so many others, can I ask, have you considered becoming a member? I want you to become a member. I do. I want to hear your voice, but because of legality and reasons that are um, just required, you have to be a member in order to have your vote count. And I think your vote should count. So I'd ask you to consider that. The way our bylaws are currently set up, and our bylaws are ultimately what uh, would have to change uh, if women were considered to be uh, uh, available for eldership. The way they are currently written is there is one word in one line of uh, our bylaw, which I'll make available to you if you'd like it. It's in the, uh, in the report, but I can also just print it off for you. Where an elder is referred to as himself. That is the one and only word in all of the bylaws that says that uh, which gender elder has to be. Here's one of the challenges that we encounter. When I bring up whether or not women can be elders, it's an emotional comment. And it's something that some people will perk up and clap their hands and say, oh good. And some people might cross their arms and say, oh no. I want you to know that we have a wide roof. Our roof covers both. You will not hear me say this one is right and that one is wrong, nor will you hear anyone else say that, at least no one officially saying that. And here's why. Because there are wise women and men who have looked into this for years, for their whole lives, who have written papers, written books, who have studied this, and they have come to a conclusion. But there are also wise people who have studied this for their entire lives, written papers, written books, and they have came to a different conclusion. The way it works in our denomination, the denomination of the Christian Missionary Alliance in Canada, is that we say that each church is to decide for themselves because it's not clear. Now here's what is clear. We are to have elders. Here's what else is clear. Jesus is Lord. These are things that are non-negotiable. But who is an elder is a point of conversation. And here is my challenge and my request to you. As we go through this and as we lean into this, for those of you who are certain you know the answer, do you trust God to speak to you again? Do you trust God that you can go to him with a question, a question that you think you know the answer to, and ask him to lead you to the answer. And furthermore, do you trust him to teach others? And that's my challenge to you. Enter into this. Enter into this humbly as we are called to, as a servant as we are called to be, and as a student Ask any teacher, the student who walks in thinking they know everything is deeply challenging and often wrong. So walk into this graciously and humbly. This is where the church is at. This is something brought to us by a member and brought to us in an appropriate way. And so we will continue uh, learning about this. And so I have entitled this sermon, What is an Elder? 
When I read books, I do something that is going to make some of you mad. (laughs) I read the first couple of paragraphs till I figure out what the book is about, and then I go to the end and I read the last chapter. Yeah. Who here just can't stand that and thinks I've done it wrong? Go ahead, raise your hand. I am being handily outvoted here, and I want you to know I don't care. That's still what I'm going to do. I'm going to the book of Revelation this morning, and I'm going to start in Revelation chapter 4, verse 4, at the end of the Bible, because we're going to find out how this pans out. That's how we're going to start. The book of Revelation as a standalone book is challenging because it is informed by all of the books that come before it. So in a very serious way, what we are learning is something that exists after all the teaching from Genesis all the way through to Revelations. Revelations chapter 4, verse 4. (laughs) 24,000... This is going to be a great Sunday. 24 thrones surrounded them. Who sits on a throne? Okay, now go to the very end. Gold crowns on their head. Who wears a gold crown and sits on a throne? Queens and kings. 24 thrones surrounded him. And 24 elders sat on them. They were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their heads. This is an image, and we find this in Revelations. And we believe that those thrones are broken into 12 and 12. The 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. Now when Jesus talked about the church and he talked about the people in his church, he talks about it as his bride and he talks about our encountering his church as a wedding reception. Think about the intimacy of a wedding reception. Anybody can go to a wedding, but you have to be invited to go to the wedding reception. And who are the people at the wedding reception? Well, there are people who know the bride and groom close enough to be invited to that, to be able to celebrate this union, what this wedding is. And it is an exciting thing that not everyone can come to. These are people who have access to Jesus and have access to the church and they know it. The way you know you have access to the bride and groom. By the way, if you ever want access to the heart of Jesus, if you ever want to watch Jesus move and do something, pray about his bride. Pray about the people within his bride, the people of his church, of his church. Not your church, his church. None of you own this church. He owns this church. He is the pastor of this church. I am simply the person who repeats his words. This wedding, this wedding reception. Realize who you are within that. Realize who you are and accept that identity. No one goes to a wedding reception and says, I don't think I know the bride and groom. You do. If you didn't, you wouldn't be invited. Do you know how I know that? Because I didn't invite almost everybody to my wedding reception. There was just a few that came with this access to me and this access to my wife. And even if they knew only me and they had never met her, they would know who she is because they knew me and they knew who I would be attracted to and vice versa. They knew the kind of person that would say yes to me and they knew the kind of person that would say yes to her and they knew that. And the, 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 the requirement and the invitation to us is step into that identity. Sometimes when we pray, we pray like God's gonna hit us. Like God's gonna say, you're bad. I didn't invite people I was gonna hit to my wedding except for the best man. But that was sort of our thing. Some of you smiled. uh, Others of you are looking at me like, no. That's okay. You know who I would invite to my wedding if we had one now? You. You're who I want there. Step into that identity. The idea of the church and the idea of that wedding reception and who is there. 
When we pray, are we praying to a God who's going to squish us like a mosquito? Or are we praying to a God who says, come to the wedding reception. Come, be heirs with me. This is why we can pray. And this is why he answers our prayer. This is why there's hope. This is why you're called to be courageous. Why? Because you're in with the king, with God. The 24 elders, we think that that's the, it represents the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. I want to point this out. All 24 of these people are worshiping God. To see God is to worship God or to flee. Nobody sees God and says, I'm undecided. Nobody. Every knee will bow. Every tongue confess. All of them. Including you. Including me. These elders, these apostles, and it's broken. We're going to use some words back and forth here. There's sort of three categories that we're going to look at today. One of them is elder. One of them is apostle. And one of them is disciple. And what you're going to see as we go through is that those lines get blurred and they overlap. And after a while, what we are talking about is leaders in the church. The elders' first job, our elders' first job, is not to the business of the church. In fact, our elders' first job has nothing actually to do with the church. Our elders' first job is to worship God. That's job number one. And once that is done, if there is time, deal with the business of the church. But if there is not time for that, and all the time is spent in worship of God, then job well done. Do you know why? Because the elders lead. And as the elders lead, people follow. And the most important thing is the worship of God. And where will you see this modeled? You will see this through the elders in the church. Elders in the Bible, that word is used to describe those that engage in care and leadership and ruleship of the church. Now, rulership is a word that might make you uncomfortable. uncomfortable. Nobody rules over me. Do you know how wrong that is? My goodness, if a police officer wants you to not do something, they'll stop you. You are ruled. You can't buy something at Costco unless they let you. We are ruled. Some way, somehow, we figured out as a culture that we are not ruled. And we are utterly astonished when the thing that we were told is going to happen if you behave this way happens when we behave that way. Couldn't possibly see that coming. If only there was some warning. It's like me standing up here and saying, I'm not going to get cold in December in Saskatchewan. You know why? Nobody makes me cold. Mm -mm. And being shocked when it's December and I'm cold. How's that different? I don't think it is. I think we are ruled and it is only our own bravado that says we aren't. And what we are ultimately saying is we are God and what we say goes and the rest of humanity says no. No, no. You will do the speed limit or you won't do any speed. You will not steal or we will stop you from being able to steal. We are ruled. And the elders are ruleship in the church. Jesus loves his people, but he also has a plan for his people. In the book of Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 27, let's put that up here. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. Whoa, whoa. To make her holy and clean. He has a desire for the church. 
to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. His desire for the church is for the people within the church to change, to become more like him, to be refined. Sometimes refinement isn't fun. Has anyone here ever been refined by the person who raised them? Anyone? Anyone ever been corrected by the person who raised them? Or maybe you are old enough that you don't remember who raised you. Have you ever refined someone else? Yeah. Yeah, that's God's desire. And the refinement of it is sometimes a little frustrating. Feels like he got a sunburnt a little bit. Feels like he got corrected. Feels like someone came to you and said, help me understand how your behavior lines up with what Scripture says. Like, I told you to do that when I was baptized, but I never actually wanted you to do it. What I wanted you to do was look at me and say, you're right. This refinement that God wants takes us from who we were and makes us more like who He is. Why? Because of His love. That's a challenge. Can you be refined out of love? Or does love only look like agreeing with you? And if that is the case, it is not refinement at all, and it is not in keeping with what God wants. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Do you realize that while we get refined, what he did was die on the cross. It was worse for him. Do you get that? This story is is complex and it's large. Instead of being who we were, we will be holy and without fault. Amazing refinement. Jesus has a plan for his people found in a plan for his people found in Ephesians 5:25 to 27. He talks about the church as his bride who he would die for and did. Jesus' plan is not just for us to gather to sing but also to perfect, to change fundamentally almost on the DNA level to make us beautiful and holy people. And the challenge is, who here has got that figured out? Raise your hand if you're doing that perfectly. I don't even get one person putting up their hand for a joke. I always get a person putting their hand up for a joke, but nobody wants to claim that. When you think back to Jesus' disciples, within those disciples was also Judas, was also Peter, was also Matthew, when it looks like Matthew and Peter didn't like each other, and that wasn't a very happy relationship. There was tension there, and there's tension here. There has always been tension in leadership. There has always been tension in his church. There has always been tension since the disciples began. But it is God's plan for unity, and it is what is called for us. That's why next week when we gather around the communion table right here and the elements are passed by you, first the question is, are you right with everyone? Have you gone to everyone and said, is there anything I need to apologize for? Not, you need to apologize for this. That does not make you right with them. That makes them right with you. Is there anyone, is there any way that I can apologize? Have I done anything? I think I have done something. I I just think maybe there's a tension here and I'm not sure what it is, but can you help me understand so that I can apologize? So that we can become a beautiful and holy people. As per Jesus' desire. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13, Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors, and the teachers. Did you know that I'm a gift? Did you know that you're a gift? Did you know that you're a gift? Now, you're probably very good Canadians, Ted, and when I say you're a gift, you go, oh, shucks, no. Yeah, stop being Canadian, start being Christian. You are a gift. You are a gift gift you can still be canadian but be christian first 
these people, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all become in, uh, till we all become, I'm going to try this sentence again. Hang on. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Going from spiritual infants to spiritual maturity, there is a change that happens there. But the problem is when you say, I've got it figured out. The elders are part of what changes that. And you look to the elders and you look to them and you say, what are you worried about? What are you not worried about? That thing that you're not worried about, I'm going to use that as instruction. I won't be worried about that either. And instead, I will come in worship. I will come to worship. I will mimic you as you sing. I will mimic you as you raise your hands. I will mimic you as you serve. And the elders lead into maturity. In John chapter 17, verse 21, this is Jesus' prayer. This is literally Jesus praying. I pray that they will be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. Jesus anticipates and demands change and maturity. And it will be evident not just to the Christians, but also to everyone else who will look at the people and say, I don't know that I believe what they believe, but man, I can tell you, they sure love each other. They love each other like crazy. I can see that. They like being with each other. They serve together. They play together. They laugh together. They eat together. understandable and seeable by everyone. Wow, look at how they love one another. Jesus wants this. People together, people unified, and he has equipped us. God wants to create new believers. And he wants to create a place where love is shown and refinement is obvious. Here's a secret. You want to be refined. Yes, you do. You want to be a better driver than what you are. You know why? Because you can love people by not crashing into them. And they will never know what you don't do. But it is through the refinement that you show your love. You also want to be a better swimmer. What if you have to swim farther? You want to be a better walker. You want to be healthier. You want to be a better singer. We want refinement. We want to be better cooks. Anyone here want to be a worse cook? Go ahead, raise your hand. We want refinement. We don't like it, but we want it. Beautiful things take place in refinement. They do. They really do. Ever seen a field where every line is as straight as an arrow? We have a term for those. It's called the near farm. They just bowed their heads. Oh, no, it's not exactly right. I know there was that one stalk once that grew off. I gotcha. It's a beautiful thing when it's dead straight. You ever seen someone shovel snow and it's just perfect? Refinement. John chapter 17, verse 19. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so that they can be made holy by your truth. We're to be like Jesus. It costs to lead, there's a sacrifice in leadership. And Jesus prays for holiness in the church. Holiness. Not bigness. 
Not warmness, not niceness, not tactfulness, not predictability, holiness. That's Jesus' prayer for his church. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety. There was something I grew up, a challenge that was given to me as I grew up, and I, I, I encountered it again at uh, Bible college, and it is something, this is the, one of the things that I have encountered the most resistance to in every church I've ever been part of, including when I was a little kid, and it is this. We look at change like it's a problem. We don't like change. But the problem is, Jesus does like change. God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety. Change. In college, I learned a church should always smell of wet paint. And there are some churches that you go into and you realize there has been no wet paint, proverbially or literally. The things that we do are still the same things that we do and we can't change. It's a problem. To all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, this was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord as we've been working through... I thought that was a train... As we've been working through the Hebrew series, do you think they know anything about change? How about when the Gentiles showed up? Change. That's not our church. Except it was their church, and it is our church, and it is his bride. It is through the church that he makes known what he has been up to all along. What has he been up to? to draw in the world through his Son. How? Through the church. When the question comes up, is the church still relevant? Oh my, do you even know what you've asked? Oh, it might look different. That would be the variety part. It might happen on your deck and should. It might happen in your backyard and should. It might be you speaking and you should. It might be you singing, and you should. That's the variety. But is it relevant? Oh, yes. As Jesus draws people through himself, to himself, through his bride, you and me. How does he do this? Through the Holy Spirit. John 14, verses 15 to 17. If you love me, obey my commandments. Can't we just love him and do what we want? So much easier. Surely not so far as it touches our finances. Surely not so much that it touches forgiveness of those who have hurt us and never apologized for it. And even if they did, they don't understand how broad that hurt was. Surely not that part. Surely not that part where God says, I have called you to change what you're doing and do something else. And you say, I can't. I've always been this and I can never be anything else. Surely not that part. If you love me, Obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because, he, because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him. Remember the wedding party? Because he lives with you now and later will be in you. Jesus gave the Holy Spirit to the church as a special gift. You're going to talk about two different gifts here. Jesus gave the Holy Spirit to the church as a gift. Jesus didn't have to do that. God didn't have to do that. God doesn't have to do anything. But as a gift, as a special gift, given us the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who speaks to us, who speaks through us who does the God stuff through the church where we are part. What does all this have to do with eldership? John chapter 12, the apostles. 
there's a uh, when when in, in the book of Acts, the New Testament church, and it starts. Uh, we start having the disciples go, and they start planting churches. And everywhere that they plant a church, they leave elders. And they say, who are the people who love the church? I mean, really love the church, who will serve the church, who will worship primarily and will draw other people into worship and will love each other and they will look for who is hungry and who is cold and who is lonely, who is disconnected and will draw them in. Who are those people? And they leave those people and there's elders. And as time goes on, there's a, a, a circumstance that we read about where there is a question of theology, much like the question we are having right now. And on the one side, there's a group of people, and they say, in order to be members in the church, you have to be circumcised. And on the other side, there's a group of people that said, Jesus came and changed all that. And there is an argument between the apostles... And the elders, not a fight, just an argument, a spirited conversation, a point of worship, if you will. And so they leave and they go to pray about this. And what we learn from this is that the elders and the apostles have the same authority. It isn't just the disciples. Now, the elders and the apostles, all three of these leading the church, all three of these going to God, each of them absolutely sure in what they believe, going to God and praying to Him again and saying, what is it you would have us do? And what comes out of that is you can be a member at a church if you are not circumcised. Actually sounds funny to us, not funny to them at all. We find ourselves in another situation just like this. Some of us very convinced But they go in love to learn. I want to point something out here. Do you know that Jesus wrote not one word of the Bible? Not one word. We don't know what his perfect handwriting looked like. We don't know what his perfect grammar was. Oh yes, all Scripture written and God breathed, but it is through the equipping of the Holy Spirit, through the person with the pen or the quill, as they write. The words that we call the Holy Scriptures came from the elders, the disciples, the apostles. That's where it came from. When we say follow Scripture, we are following in the elders of the church, counting on them to have prayed to God, have heard what God said, and reported it back to us, and taught us the very same thing that I do. That is the authority of the elders. That is the authority of the apostles. That is the authority of the disciples. That is the requirement of them, empowered by the Holy Spirit and sent out to preach. Some of them were good preachers. Some of them, not so much. Kind of hard to read what they said. Doesn't flow very well. All of them sent and all of them equipped to what they are sent to do. And apart from them, we have no record of Jesus Christ whatsoever, save from some Roman record that says there was a man named Jesus from Galilee who was crucified. One of many. It's like saying there's a guy named Dave from Kindersley. We have a few. Do you understand that? Like that's, It's an amazing thing to me. Without the report of the apostles, of the elders, we have no record of Jesus. The twelve preached the gospel. The twelve found others and said, Now you preach the gospel. Go tell the good news. And some of them said, I don't preach, but I can sing. Rock on. Here is a microphone. They didn't have microphones. And out of that is compiled the New Testament. Jesus also gave gifts 
of the Holy Spirit, a gift for people to spiritually minister, a gift for someone to go to someone else and be in their presence, and the truth of who the Holy Spirit is, the truth of who Jesus is, the proof of, the proof of who God is flow through them to a person. Not a word is said. But the grieving person, the hurting person, the hungry person is ministered to by the equipping of the Holy Spirit in one of the elders. Who are the elders? Who are the elders in the church? By the way, sometimes when we look at elders, we look at finally we've got a person who's going to take care of the plumbing. We've got a plumber. We've got someone who can do electrical. Finally, we've got a finance person. They're a great finance person. I want to pull you back from that and say, number one, number one, elders are not there for you to fuss at. No, they are not. Oh, talk to them. Ask questions. But not for you to fuss at. Not for you to just, just a little bit. Just get them. Just a little bit. Although we do like to do that to people in authority, don't we? Yeah, we do. We do. You ever been told no at SGI? I'm going to get them. Even though they're reading what's on the screen. No. You ever had a school teacher or a principal say no? Actually, that one's way too close to home. We've got a kid graduating, so I'm going to just move on from that point. This is why the world's best farmer is not necessarily the world's best elder. This is why we do not look for the world's best accountant to be the elder. This is why we don't look for the best electrician, the best singer, the best cook to be an elder. This is something I go through each year as the nominating committee looks at all of the elders that are represented in the church. Who are the elders who, have, who God has selected to be on the board this season? Not every season, this season. And the question is, look, who worships God in a way that makes me want to follow? In a way that refines me? Who is a person that looks to God in a way that makes me say, I want to look towards God the way that person looks towards God who loves people in a way that I want to emulate and I want to follow let's go to the next slide here Sai. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 and 12 now these are the gifts Christ has given to the church the apostles, the prophets the evangelists and the pastors and the teachers Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work. I'm sorry, I must have read that wrong. Their responsibility is to do all of God's work so that I can sit here and sing the songs, but I better like the style. You ever been to that church? I've been a pastor at those churches. You know what the good news is? They're being refined. They're being refined. They're being changed. It hurts. They want someone to not look at them, but rather look at someone else. Let's get the elders. The job, their responsibility, is to equip God's people, you, to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Your job. Make it happen that more people come to church however you got to do it. Through song, with a new guy in town singing songs. Through cars, that's just one of the tools in my toolbox. Through farming, through coaching, through coffee, through silent prayer at home. Through singing boldly, even though someone might be looking. Through leadership. By the way, I mean this. Oh, if you think I'm talking about you, I am. We need people to work in kids' ministry. We need you to work in kids' ministry. We need people to come on stage to play and sing. It would be good if you know how to sing, but if you don't, you will not thwart the Holy Spirit. We need you to serve. But actually... For years I have been praying for someone who wants to plan parties. You don't have to speak 
in front of crowds, you have to plan parties. We need a party planner, badly. We need youth leaders, badly. We need a wanna leaders. We need women's ministry leaders. Wouldn't it be fun if beside women's ministry we had men's ministry? We need leaders. And if you look at the elders and say, but we have elders, we have a pastor, you do it, then you have misread your role in the bride of Christ, the wedding reception that you're invited to because you have access to the bride and groom. You know them. You actually know them well enough to be invited to the wedding. We need you. God has given these gifts to the church to build up the church. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and again in Acts chapter 2, verse, <laughs> verse 15 to 42, we have the apostles leading, and then we have the elders leading leading as the apostles go plant other churches and bring other leaders. All believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper. We're going to do the Lord's Supper easily next week. How about in sharing in meals? Let's get together. Let's eat together even if that's not what we normally do, and even if that's not what we've done in the past, let's use variety. Let's change the patterns. Invite someone. Oh, for heaven's sakes, invite someone who you haven't already invited. If you are constantly in the habit of inviting the same people over and over, that's great and it's decadent. Don't you think someone else would want to be part of that? And we are equipped to do so. Let's go to the next slide. In 1 Timothy Timothy chapter 3 and again in Titus chapter 1, we find the list of what an elder is. And I'm not going to go through that right now. It's the same list twice. It is critical that you read it and that you understand what it is and you understand what we are looking for in an elder. And if you can find something in that list that isn't represented perfectly in one of our elders' lives, then I've got good news for you. It's the same as every other elder board that ever has been since the beginning in the process of being refined. But the question is, do these people love the church? Do you know that God loved you enough to leave people in your path to love you? And he called them elders. No, he did not leave people in your path to do your bidding, to see it your way, to make the church do things. No, he did not. He left people to love you. So what is an elder? An elder is a Christian in the local church who because of spiritual maturity and gifts from the Holy Spirit and desire is set apart to rule that church as God sees fit. That is who an elder is. Our elders board, we have got Doug Clawson. He's our board chair. Doug Clawson is sitting here trying hard not to look at me right now, feeling all conspicuous. Don't worry, Doug. I'm only going to talk to you for a minute and then I'll talk about Ted. Doug serves in multiple places. He serves in sport. He serves as a pastor. He serves as a counselor. He serves sneaky in, church, uh, in schools. Doesn't tell them that he's serving. That's okay. Holy Spirit works. He serves in his own home with his own children. And I asked him, would he come on the board? Would he consider it? And he said, I will serve in so many words. He serves. Myron Bestwetherick, he serves. Myron Bestwetherick is currently doing sound at the back. He's here early and he leaves late. There is a lot that happens in this building that you don't know how it happens. And the way it happens is Myron Bestwetherick. Myron Bestwetherick serves me by meeting with me every couple of weeks and we eat breakfast and we talk about the things that are on our hearts. 
Myron Bess Weatherick serves his family and his children. He also serves on the football team. He also serves at John Deere and he serves the farmers. He drives out to them and sometimes he sells them equipment, but always he brings the presence of the Holy Spirit with him. Always. And he serves because he sings. And he serves as he and Jer decorate the church, which is something I'm not going to do. And he serves as he sets up for communion. And he serves as he sets up for the young adults, or did. You got fired from that, right? The young adults said you're too old, they don't want you anymore. Is that, is that how it went, Derek? Kind of like that? <laughs> Two nods, that's funny. He serves in a lot of different ways. Dwayne Summick, guys like me need guys like him in a way that he thinks he understands, but he really doesn't. He's details. He can look through paperwork and see what it really means. He has a mind for structure. He has a mind for finance. He is treasurer, but if he wasn't, I would want him to be elder. Because he loves God and he has a pattern of loving Jesus where he goes. I know his children. His children are very meaningful to my family. They love Jesus and they serve. Right now, Beth is responsible for our live stream. She comes from that family and was taught and was led. Dwayne serves behind the scenes, quietly, and he serves in finance where if we don't have enough money, somehow that becomes his fault. It's not his fault. He loves. Ted Glass. Ted Glass serves in so many ways. He serves with Awana. He serves often as a pinch hitter for youth. In some of the snowstorms we've had in the last couple of years, I've called him and said, I'm not going to get a chance to shovel. There's too much going on. Can you come? And he shoveled so that you could park. There are things he's asked me not to tell you, but I want to tell you he was gone over and above in a way that you would go, I can't believe it. He serves. Currently, his wife is teaching my kids right out there. And on Wednesday... They're teaching my kids right here. He is also the solution to quite a few different problems that we have logistically at the church. He's also a conservation officer. I have been with him as he has been gracious to people who did not require grace. Do you hear what I'm saying? Where it could have gone the other way and it didn't, and it is because of the Holy Spirit in him and through him. Eric Friesen, as I speak right now, is with a group of kids at a racetrack in Saskatoon. Do you know how he started today? He had church at the racetrack. That has never happened until Eric got there. He's called the faster pastor. Emphasis on the pastor. There are faster cars out there. He's got a group of boys that are watching him, their eyeballs open like saucers because they can't believe this car guy says, we're going to have church. And there are some rough and rattly old car guys that come. They won't sit, but they'll lean against the trailer and listen to what he says. And he says, Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible told me so. The little ones belong to him. What's the next part? I'm forgetting my song. They are weak, but he is strong. Ah, uh, Jesus loves you. Yeah, uh, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Uh, the Bible told me so. I'm going to get a text later on today. Oh, Pete, I think I ruined it all. I stumbled over the words. I didn't know what to say. Anyone here worried about that? That is the equipping of the Holy Spirit through Eric Friesen. And he is one of the elders. By the way, I dare you, if you don't feel loved, go tell him. 
I double dog dare you. He'll be o- you'll be over at his house. He will be feeding you a massive chunk of meat. He will show you the things he loves. He will stick you in, your, in his hot tub whether or not you want to go and you will be invited back the next day. He's extra. And it's the equipping of the Holy Spirit. By the way, you should go to him and talk to him about his full story. Find out who he was and find out who he is. And I am one of the elders here. I have been equipped to preach. I have been equipped to lead. And I have been equipped to find people who function where I am weak. And I have been equipped to call you and say, Hey, it's your turn. Come and lead. I know you're not comfortable. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Come. Come. i got to bring this to a close. I'm going to invite the worship team to come to the front. (laughs) This is the first sermon there will be more. And we're going to talk more about this stuff. Do you trust God to speak? Do you trust God to speak to you and to speak to others? Do you trust God to refine you? Do you trust God to change you? Don't you want Him to? Do you trust the body to be led by the elders the way it has always been? since the beginning of the New Testament, since the beginning of Pentecost. Do you? Then I invite you to enter into this humbly. I invite you to pray a lot about this. I invite you to come to everything, and I invite you with the warmest invitation, come to the table. Be a member. Let's hear your voice. Be refined. Let God touch the parts of your life such as baptism, such as finance, such as relationship. Ask God to use you and then be willing to be used. Some of us preach. Some of us sing. Some of us Look at the systems in the church with more clarity than others. Some of us work way behind the scenes. Some of us plan parties. I'd love to meet you. All of us are called into spiritual maturity. And servanthood, as Jesus was a servant, is the definition of spiritual maturity. You can't not be like Jesus and be like Jesus. That doesn't work. So, now we're going to worship Jesus. And I invite you to do so with gusto. Go home. Confess your sins to God. Confess your sins to each other. Get right with each other. Come back to the place that smells of the Holy Spirit's aftershave. Where the Holy Spirit fingerprints are everywhere. Where you yourself were invited. Come. Be refined. Enter into spiritual maturity. Put away the pablum. Put away the bag of spiritual rattles. There is something greater. You want this, I'm telling you. How many times I said to my children, you want this. You want this. Church, You want this. Put away the toys. Step into something great. Watch for the Holy Spirit 
to move through you. Oh, you are not responsible for the harvest. He does that. Nobody comes to the Father but through Him. And you didn't either. Lord God, so we enter humbly and willingly into this next stage, this next bookmark in the calendar of your bride. It was something serious to bring before you. As serious as the cry for rain or the cry for sun. Make us humble, oh God. Make us humble. Don't let us become arrogant and stiff-necked. But let us come to you to listen. Let us come to each other to listen. And let us seek you, who is an elder God, a spiritually mature person who worships you first and foremost, and everything else after the fact, if there's time. But we follow the elders into worship. Thank you for this wedding reception. Thank you for our invitation. Oh Lord, let this wedding be wonderful. Let this marriage be wonderful. In your name I pray, amen. As you leave the wedding, I, uh, you can't throw rice. The birds are going to eat it and they'll blow up. And that's bad, I'm told. As you go, make sure that you give the bride and groom a hug. Some of you have come from far away. Bride and groom want you to know that they're glad that you're here and that they love you. Thanks for coming to the wedding. We'll see you next week.